We've all heard about the brain, and we've all heard about drugs' effect on it. But when we zoom in, what are drugs actually doing to the cells that make up your brain? Inside your brain, all of your nerve cells, or neurons, are able to send signals to each other. They do so by sending electrical signals down their axons, which are received by the dendrite of the receiving cell. But the cells are not completely connected. There is a gap between the axon tip and the dendrite of the next cell. This gap is called the synapse. The cell before the synapse is called the presynaptic cell, and the cell at the receiving side of the synapse is called the postsynaptic cell. Just so you know, an action potential is an electrochemical signal that requires neurotransmitters to be passed between neurons. It is the type of signal that neurons use to communicate. There are a few main components of the synapse. The first is the neurotransmitter. They are the actual things that are passed across the synapse. When a signal is not being sent, they rest next to the edge of the axon inside vesicle. When the signal or action potential does in fact get sent and reaches them, exocytosis occurs, causing them to leave the presynaptic axon tip. Once in the synapse, they diffuse across to the postsynaptic dendrites. These neurotransmitters then connect with receptor proteins on the postsynaptic cell. Once enough have connected, meaning the threshold has been reached, they trigger the sending of an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. The shape of receptor proteins are specific to the particular neurotransmitter that they receive. In this way, receptor proteins follow the same lock and key mechanism as enzymes. They will only react if their specific neurotransmitter, or in this metaphor, their key, connects with them. After the signal is passed on, the neurotransmitters need to be removed. Otherwise, the neurons would not only continually send signals, but neurons would only ever be able to send one signal. To perform this job, there are reuptake proteins. Reuptake proteins, through active transport, take neurotransmitters from the receptors and put them back into the axon tip, ready to be exocytosed again. In this way, signals can be repeatedly sent, and the system functions normally. Action potentials are not the only things that trigger the sending of neurotransmitters. Proteins called enkephalins, or endorphins, can also cause neurotransmitters to be fired. Endorphins are received by opiate receptors. Endorphins normally act as a painkiller and lead to feelings of pleasure and relaxation. They are naturally occurring. Cocaine affects the synapses by blocking reuptake protein. This makes it so that dopamine cannot be reabsorbed back into the axon tip. In addition to the dopamine present at the time of the cocaine intake already resting in the synapse, all newly released dopamine also gets stuck in the synapse, repeatedly connecting with dopamine receptors. This causes an extremely large amount of dopamine to reside in the synapse for an extended duration of time. This creates very large feelings of pleasure, and causes the user of the cocaine to experience these feelings until the cocaine is worn off. The other effects of cocaine are increased central nervous activity and an increased heartbeat. Normally, endorphins, or enkephalins, work as explained earlier, by causing neurotransmitters to be fired across the synapse. Opiates, such as heroin, closely resemble endorphins. When heroin enters the body, it interacts with opiate receptors, making it seem like the body is releasing lots of endorphins. This causes a spike in the amount of neurotransmitters that are released, resulting in a state of relaxation and pleasure, along with acting as a painkiller. While the high induced by drugs may be enjoyable, there may also be bad consequences. For example, cocaine increases heart rate greatly. In fact, most cocaine-associated deaths are caused by heart attacks. Heroin, on the other hand, depresses the central nervous system. It may slow the heart rate and breathing rate, possibly even to the point of death. In addition, since heroin is usually injected, it is possible to use a contaminated needle and contract diseases. In the long term, the major lasting effect of cocaine and heroin abuse, and most other substance abuse, is something called downregulation. Since all proteins degrade over time, new proteins must be made to replace these old proteins. The amount of new proteins that is made is determined by the necessity of the old proteins as being replaced. This is where the mechanisms by which heroin and cocaine affect the synapse apply. When there is an excess of a substance, for example, when dopamine is kept in the synapse by cocaine, it becomes less necessary for there to be as many receptors of dopamine. Think about it. 
Why waste energy building unnecessary proteins when other, more useful proteins could be built somewhere else? What you are seeing now is an example of proteins in a membrane degrading over time and not being replaced. Once the number of receptor proteins has been reduced, other problems begin to occur. Because of downregulation, more of an input is needed to reach the threshold to send a signal. Because of this, and because the body normally does not have such an extremely large amount of opiates or dopamine, people need more and more of the substances to be able to reach the same high that they used to be able to gain. In addition, because the body has become so desensitized to normal amounts of opiates or dopamine, normal life seems boring and dull. Nothing seems fun because there's no spike of dopamine or opiates. Addictions can become all-consuming and extremely dangerous for a person. Treatment options exist, however, and with long-term abstinence, addicts can become unaddicted. Well, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you learned about the nervous system and synapses. See ya!